further back to um, the bonds on the premium. We already went through bonds issued at a discount. Just want to explain one or two more things about the discount. I had some questions during office hours again. So when bonds will sell, why would, why would a bond sell for a discount? A bond will sell for a discount when the market rate exceeds the stated rate of interest. Let me repeat that. Okay. All right, so just to get us back, hold down, please. Just to get us back to where we left off on Tuesday. We said that the bonds would be priced to yield the market rate of interest. Market rate of interest is the rate that you can get anywhere else in the market for a similar investment. If I come to market with a bond that has a stated rate, that's the rate on the bond certificate, that's equal to the market rate, the bonds will sell at par, and the cost of borrowing will be equal to the market rate. So you'll always have this case. So let's say, again, I have a market rate of 10% of and the bonds are going to be issued at 10%. Then I'll be in equilibrium. What would happen if the market rate is higher? So if the market rate is something like you know 11%, but my bonds offer 10%, the bonds will sell for what is known as a discount. And the discount is a price below par. Now, we went through the examples of issuing a bond at par, and we went through examples of issuing bonds at a discount. The question then, I think, for everyone is, what is the effective cost of borrowing? I think what you need to understand is that the cost of borrowing will always be equal to the market rate of interest. So that if I now look at this cost of borrowing for the corporation, the cost of borrowing is going to be 10%. Now in this case, you might say, well, is it the par or is it the stated rate? Well, I'm sorry, market or the stated rate, it's the market rate. In the case of the discount, what's the cost of borrowing? It's 11%. It's the market rate. Now, the reason why that happens is because when you look at a bond at a discount, I'll give you some very simple numbers, but when you look at a bond at a discount, the fact that you collect less money when you borrow than you have to pay back increases your cost of borrowing. So let me explain this with a very simple example. Let's assume that the bonds today at time period zero would have a coupon rate of 10% and the market rate is 11. And let's say the bonds have a par value of 1,000. At maturity, at the maturity date, I have to pay you back 1,000. Because the market is giving me more than the bonds that I'm selling or the bonds that you could buy from me, you're not going to give me face value. You give me something like 900. So I only collect 900 today, but I've got to pay you back 1,000. The difference between the two is the discount. And the discount is 100. And as I said, it represents additional, additional interest. Now, let's assume that the bond had no interest. There are, some, there are bonds known as what? Zero coupon bonds. There are bonds that have no interest at all stated, but there's interest in this case. So that the fact that you only have $900 to use and have to pay me back 1000 is going to increase the rate of interest from 10% to 11%. You still have to give me, let's say the rate is what? It's 10%. So 10% on 1,000 is going to be $100. So I still have I 
I still have cash interest that I have to pay. And at the same time, the discount increases that interest. So I'll go over another example with you in a second. But I just want to make sure that you understand that the discount is, in fact, going to add to the cost of borrowing. So, so far, that's where we were. Bonds issued at par, bonds issued at a discount, and we'll get to the premium in a second. All right, so now let's go back. I want to go back to the discount case where we left off. So go back to slide 40, and I want to repeat this with you just to make sure some of the things we do at the end, of course, I always like to go over again if we can. So just to review, in the case where the market rate exceeds the stated rate of the bond, the bonds will sell at a discount. The discount is a contra liability account, and the discount will result in incurring a higher market rate of interest. You will always incur the market rate. If you look at a bond investment as a product, it means that a product with a lower interest rate is inferior and will not sell for its face value. The discount as we said, is something you pay back at maturity. You pay it back at maturity, but we're not on a cash basis. Because we're on the accrual basis, you have to recognize the discount each period, and that discount is amortized. So let's take a look. I'm going to go over this example one more time. So let's say that we have these bonds that are $100,000. They have a face rate, a stated rate of 9%. And I went over, I did some exam reviews today. Make sure you know all of the synonyms. That's what makes accounting difficult. Someone said, well, I got confused. I saw salvage value versus residual or scrap. They're all the same. So that 9% is the stated rate. It's the face rate. It's the coupon rate. They're all the same. 9%, five years, pays interest semi-annually. So that interest rate on a semi-annual basis is 4.5%. And one of the last things I said is that you have to be very careful because if I'm looking for the interest for the first year, it's two interest periods. So you have to make sure that you cover two interest periods per year. The market rate of interest is 10%. Now, the going market price of these bonds, because as I said, people will not pay face value for a bond that offers less interest, and as a result, the bonds will sell for a discount. They will only sell for 96149 and the discount is 3851 So that the bond price is quoted as a percentage of par. In this course, we give you the bond price. The difference between the face value of 100 and the issue price of the bond is the discount. So we will give you that information. In other courses, you have to calculate the bond price by using discounted cash flow. Now, in this case, when you make the entry, you have to remember that the bonds are always on the balance sheet at their carrying value, which is made up of the bond payable at par and the discount, which is the contra. So the journal entry debits cash for the amount you receive. You only receive 96149 You debit the discount, which represents, in effect, a deferral of interest expense. That is actually an interest cost to you and you credit the bonds payable for 100. Now, even though the bonds sell for 96, 149, you ultimately, at maturity, have to pay back 100,000. Now, of course, if you decided to change your mind and say, you know what, I don't want to you know, borrow this money, I would be able to pay you back today, instantly, at 96, 149. But as time goes on, I owe you more and more money and the money I owe you increases as the discount goes down. At maturity, I would owe you, or this company, would owe $100,000. So the discount is a contra liability on the balance sheet, and on the balance sheet, you have to show the carrying value. The carrying value is 96149 initially, and it is set up by having a credit to the bonds payable at par and a debit to the contra account for the discount. On the balance sheet, you see the carrying value of 96,149. Any questions on the discount, and of course, on the balance sheet, it appears as you see it. So if you were building a balance sheet right now, you'd have bonds payable at par, less the discount. 
Yeah. So why do companies offer bond at a discount at in, in most cases, the discount, let me, I'll give you the reality of, 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 uh, of corporate financing. Typically, you're trying to go to market at the market rate. So you would not want to go to market at a discount. So if, and, and usually, in the United States, the investment banking um, or the um, bond issue process takes about a week. And during that week, there's generally not an unusual you know, spike or decline in interest rates. So the premiums and discounts are actually very, very minor in practice, unless there's a huge you know, aberration in the market. So typically, you try to go to market at par. Now, what could happen is that you want to go to a zero coupon model. And a zero coupon model is known as a deep discount. So if my bonds give you no cash interest, then it's, it's advantageous to use the discount model because I, I don't have to give cash each period. So typically, the discounts are not that material. They could be, but they're not that material. It depends on different markets. I know in Canada, it takes about two weeks for bonds to be issued. And during that time, there could be a little bit of a spike. I don't know if I mentioned in this class, but about way back, about 30, 40 years ago, AT&T actually decided not to issue bonds because there's something happened within the period that they printed the bonds and got ready to go to market. An unusual spike in interest rates took place, and they didn't want to go to market for two reasons. One, the cost of borrowing would be too high. Secondly, they walked out of the market with less money than they needed. So if I really needed $100,000 and the discount kept going up, I may not want to issue those bonds because I can't borrow what I need at that interest rate. So it's a good question. I mean, typically, discounts and premiums are not as significant as we make them out in textbooks only because of the, um, of the, the need to get some numbers we can work with. But you know, zero coupon bonds are going to be extremely, extremely significant. All right, so any other questions on the balance sheet presentation of a bond that is sold at a discount, bonds that are sold at a discount? Now. The amortization process is a straight line process. So let me just see if I can map this out for you. Then we'll go back and we'll look at the journal entries. If we look at the amortization process on a timeline, Bonds are going to be issued at 96.149, and the cash interest component is 450. This count is 38.51, and I'm going to amortize that on a straight line basis. So every period, I'm going to amortize 385. Now, to explain the way this works is that in the amortization process, you're doing two things. One is you're accruing additional interest. And if you remember accrued interest from chapters you know, four, five, when we did the adjusting entries, what's the journal entry to accrue interest? You, you debit interest expense, and you credit a liability, interest payable. That's exactly what you're doing with discount amortization. Discount amortization is not anything special. It's nothing more than accrued but unpaid interest. As time goes on, I'm going to owe you more and more on this bond, correct? Because if you move that timeline way out, it's going to wind up going to 100000 So how do we account for it? And as I said, we're not on a cash basis. If we were on a cash basis, we would wait until we paid the bond at maturity to recognize the additional cost to borrow. So what happens is when we amortize the discount, two things occur. One is we increase the liability by 385, and we increase interest expense by 385. I'm sorry, it's 4,500 rather. It's 4,500. 
So the interest expense is four thousand five hundred plus the three eighty five. So the interest expense for the first period is going to be forty eight eighty five. Now, what I want you to be sure to understand is that even though that's that again, I'm sorry, I left off a zero, it should be forty five hundred, four thousand five hundred. So even though I only need to pay you forty five hundred, my interest expense is four thousand eight eighty five. And what happens to the balance of the liability? When you amortize the discount, the balance of the liability goes up to ninety six. 534. So every time you amortize the discount, interest expense goes up and the bond carrying value goes up. I owe you more money every time I amortize the discount and I also increase my interest expense. So essentially, if you want to look at it in a very simple way, the 4500 is the cash interest that's paid and the 385 is the accrued interest. So it's really nothing different than what you looked at in the first couple of chapters where interest is accrued on the outstanding balance of the debt. Now this process occurs again. And by the way, that's only the first period, not the first year. What do you think happens next period? On the amortization table. Same thing. You add 385 to the bond, and you add 385 to the interest cost. And the difference, although you don't see it exactly, is bringing this, for example, if you were looking at this from the standpoint of the cost of borrowing, this interest expense is reflecting the market rate of 5% semi-annually or 10% annually. The cash interest represents the 9%. The discount amortization, or the accrued interest, is the adjustment that brings the stated rate on the bond to the market rate. And that's what you're seeing there. As the interest expense goes up, that's what's being reflected on the financial statements. So that is, a, I guess, a way to view the amortization process. Now, if you want to, you can, let's go back to the amortization table. The other way to see this is to look at it from the standpoint of building an amortization table in advance. So it's exactly what we said, that the interest expense goes up by 385 every period. The bond goes up by 385 every period. So that last column, the bond book value, BV book value, or carrying value, that is going up by 385 every period. So if you look at the numbers, 45,000 is the total cash interest that you pay. 45,000 total cash interest paid each period. 3851 is the discount, which only gets paid at maturity, but gets recognized throughout. So the effective cost of borrowing, from over here, the effective cost of borrowing is 48,851. So in other words, if you were able to issue these bonds at par, your interest cost would have been 45,000. The fact that you issued them at a discount, your interest cost goes up to 48,851. So this is the equivalent of issuing a 10% bond rather than a 9% bond at a discount. It's the same thing. So the discount amortization process is effectively bringing your interest cost up to the market rate of interest. Now, you don't necessarily need a whole table. You know, you can uh, do it year by year, but again, the carrying value of the bond is always equal to the par value minus the balance of the discount. Now, let me go through one more with you. Let's take the first interest period. The first interest period, debits interest expense for 48.85, credits cash for 45, and then the discount for 385. As you reduce the discount, the liability is going to go up. So that you notice that on the T accounts, as the discount is being reduced, the carrying value is going up. At this point, you could track it back to the um, you could track this back to the table. But right now, 100,000 minus the 3,081 is 96,919. 
That's the carrying value. So at the end of the first year, those are two interest periods, it's 96919 And on the balance sheet, that's the way the carrying value would be reflected. So the carrying value is going to be reflected in that way. All right, so now, before we go to the premium case, any questions on the discount case? Yes. Okay, it's a good question. What if the market rate changes? Under accounting for this under the cost net or the cost principle, we don't reflect market rates in the debt. Now, if you were an investor and if you were using, let's say, fair value accounting, remember we talked about if, if these securities were held as trading or available for sale, then as the market rate fluctuates, so does the bond market price. So then, for example, if interest rates kept going up, the value of these bonds would go down for the investor, and they would have a loss, and that loss would go into either income or comprehensive income, depending on whether it's available for sale or trading. As far as a corporation is concerned, they generally do not use market values for their debt. There are exceptions, but, but they generally use the historical cost model. So this is based on historical cost. That's a very good question because just like, in a, you know, maybe by the end of today, if we start looking at stockholders' equity or definitely next week, next Wednesday when we come in for the last class uh, before the holiday break, when we look at stockholders' equity, you're going to find out that if you issue stock, for instance, if General Motors issued stock in 1925 and they sold that stock for $3, it's on their books in stockholders' equity at $3. If the original Apple shares were sold for five bucks, now they're up in the market at almost 550 or something like that. The 550 does not go into Apple stockholders' equity. The original five dollars sits in their equity account. So we don't reflect the market values in the debt or equity typically. Yeah. Uh, what was the value of cash um, on that journal entry? The cash. The cash is the 48.85 because. Um, I'm sorry, the cash is the 4500 rather. Yeah, that's the cash interest. The interest expense is 4885 okay. And then you notice the discount is a non-cash component because it's only paid when? At maturity? Essentially when you pay back the bond. All right, are there any other questions on the discount case? So I wanted to spend at least you know, another 15, 20 minutes going over this just to be sure we had it. The last thing we do, always like to be sure. All right, so now, what about the premium? What about the opposite case? Okay. If the bonds go to market and they are offering a higher interest rate than what you can get anywhere else, the price is going to be bid up. So you're going to wind up getting more money than the face value of the bond. The bond premium is going to lower your cost of borrowing. And I think that is something you can think of in terms of, you know, just a very common sense way to look at it. If I gave you $1,100 today, I give you $1,100, and I tell you, you only have to pay me back 1000 the extra 100 is the premium. And that premium is actually going to reduce your cost of borrowing. The premium will reduce your cost of borrowing. So that you'll find that the amortization of the premium is just the opposite. So in this case, and in fact, let me just show you another reason why, just let me map this out again on a timeline for you. What if, what if you had this situation? A very simple case. Let's say you have a bond, it's a thousand dollar bond, and the bond has a coupon rate of 10%, and those bonds sell for a premium, market rate's higher. So let's say the market rate is, you know, market rate is like 11%. Now, every period,
every period I have to pay you $100 of cash interest. So that's my cash interest. And I'm going to go out to maturity. So I think the best way to look at this story is to say, you received $1,200 today. So you have $1,200, and you got to pay me back 1000 Regardless of what the bonds sell for, I still have to pay you the coupon interest. So I always have to give you 100 Now, the premium, in this case, um, we'll, we'll do some actual you know, numbers in a second. But the premium is 200 and that's really interest savings. That's really interest savings. So I have $200 more than I have to pay you back. So that lowers my cost of borrow. Now, one thing I always remembered from my intro class back when they used to use candles in classrooms and things like that for lights. The teacher told me, look, if you don't understand why a premium is going to reduce interest costs, just look at the numbers up there. The first two interest payments you're getting for free. It's like I'm giving back you your I'm giving you back your own money. So essentially, that premium, that extra two hundred dollars, could be used to pay off the first two interest payments. So effectively, I get the first two interest payments free, and therefore my total cost of borrowing has to be less. So a very simple way to look at this is that the premium is going to be used to give the investors back their own cash and it saves you money and therefore lowers your interest cost. So a premium is going to be interest savings. Now, when we start getting into some of the larger numbers, you might lose this perspective. But the perspective is very simple. If the market rate is higher, I'm sorry, if the um, market rate's got to be lower, I'm sorry. Market rate's got to be lower in this case, 8%, sorry about that. Market rate's got to be lower. If the market rate is lower than the rate on my bonds, so if the market offers 8%, and I'm giving you 10, then I'm going to wind up selling these bonds at a premium. The premium is extra cash that I have to pay back the investor. This means that the first two interest payments are going to be given to you with your own money. That lowers your rate of return, but it lowers my cost of borrowing. So the premium is going to reduce your interest cost. Market rates lower, you give me more money because my bonds pay more, but eventually I'm going to be give, using your extra $200 to pay your interest. So the premium will lower the interest cost. Now, we'll see some actual numbers in a second, but any questions on that concept that the premium will be lowering the cost of borrowing because you're giving back the investor their own money? Issue, if you issue. If you issue at a discount, interest expense is higher than the cash interest. So, is the cost of borrowing always going to be equal to if you buy it at a higher value? Or? It, yeah, the concept is that no matter what the bonds are issued at, you always pay the face rate or the market rate. The market rate. So, whether you issue them at par, at a premium, or at a discount. So, as we were saying before, I can find that. Uh, So if you notice, if, if the market rate's 10 and the stated rate's 10, my cost of borrowing is market. If the market rate's 11 and the, the stated rate is 10, my cost of borrowing is 11. In the premium case, let's go to the premium case, if the market rate's 8 and my bonds are at 10, that'll be a premium and the cost of borrowing is 8%. It's always going to be at the market rate. Right? So whether they're par, premium, or discount, you always issue them, you always incur the market rate. The investor, and to go back to this diagram, the investor actually makes less money on this investment because they had to pay more to get 10%. Okay. So again, the $200 premium here on an 8% 8, 8 market 
but you want a 10% bond, yeah, you know, you'll get extra cash interest, but ultimately, I'm using your money to give you the interest payments, the first two. All right, so now let's take a look at some actual numbers. In this example, this will be on slide 52, it tells you that assume smart touch now is issuing bonds for 100,000. Their face value is 9. The market is 8. Since the market's lower, the bonds paid or the bonds will sell at a premium. The bonds will still have to pay a face rate of 9% semi-annually, that's 4 and a half. And since it's a 5-year bond, it's going to have 10 interest periods. The bonds will sell and we'll, we'll be giving you these numbers. Now, you, you're either going to get the 104 for homework or today's quiz, you'll either get the 1041 or the percentage, but the bonds sell for 104,100, and therefore there's a premium of 4,100 on the bonds. There's a 4,100 premium on the bonds. When you record the entry, you're going to debit cash for the amount that you receive. You receive 1041. You credit bonds payable at par, but notice that the premium at 4100 is an adjunct account. It is not a contra account, it is an adjunct. It means that it gets added to the bonds on the balance sheet. So the carrying value of the bonds right now are 4104 That is the carrying value. So if you look at the balance sheet, it's going to tell you that the main account or the bonds payable account is at 100,000. 4,100 is the adjunct or the premium, and together the carrying value is 1041. It's 1041. That is the premium case where the premium represents an adjunct to the bond account. You could never separate a, a contra. You could never separate out an adjunct. They're always reported together. So because the market rate is lower, than the stated rate the bonds sell for a premium. On the balance sheet, of course, you'll see it in exactly that way on the face of the balance sheet. Now, same thing's going to happen. When did you collect the premium? You collected the premium on the date you sold the bond. We're not on a cash basis, so we have to reflect the interest savings through amortization. So every period, the cash interest has to be paid, but the effective interest will be reduced. You reduce that through the amortization process. So in this case, the premium amortization will be amortized over 10 interest periods. Don't forget the bonds will pay 4,500 in cash. The bonds pay 4,500 in cash, but the discount amortized on a straight line basis is 410. So even though you pay 4500 in interest, your effective interest is reduced by 410. So you have to amortize that, and your effective interest goes down to 4090 So that if you look at the next slide, interest expense each period is going to be 4500 minus the 410 in the amortization, so that you get 4090 4090 as your interest expense. Now, you continue to amortize the premium until the bonds are brought down to par value. Okay, so now, let me see if I can put the premium schedule up here. You can probably see it better. So this is a premium amortization table. The cash paid is the cash interest and that's at the coupon rate of 9%. The interest expense is reduced by the premium amortization. The premium amortization is going to be the 4,100 divided by 10, so your effective interest cost is 4090 each period. And notice what happens. As you amortize the premium, the carrying value is going to go down until it reaches 100,000. So each period, as the premium gets amortized, the carrying value of the bond decreases. Now the opposite, as you can see, from the discount case, is that the cash interest is the same. And I think, Amir, that was the question you had before. 
when you talked about par value, it doesn't matter what the issue price of the bond is. The cash interest does not change. So that cash interest is the same whether the bonds are issued at par, whether they're issued at a premium, or at a discount. The cash interest is constant. What changes is the effective cost of borrowing or the effective interest. The effective interest changes and it adjusts to the market rate. So regardless of the bond issue price, the bonds will always reflect the market rate of interest on the income statement. And of course, when the premium is fully amortized, the bonds will be on the balance sheet at their par value or at their maturity, or I should say at their face value. And when you make the interest adjustment, let me show you the journal entry. When you make the interest adjustment, notice that the interest expense is lower than the cash interest. And that's what I meant before, because when I'm giving back that cash, I'm really not charging the same amount of interest. I'm actually giving back some of your own money. So in other words, it's costing me less because I had extra money to use. So the premium will reduce the interest cost. And that's for the first period, and this would be for the second period. The entries are always the same. So you have a debit to interest expense for 4090. You have a debit to the premium for 410, and cash is always at the 9% coupon rate. And that's the first interest period, and the second interest period is here. And when you're done posting these, don't forget you have to post these to T accounts. This is what it would look like. The balance of the bond par value does not change, and the bond's payable premium gets reduced. So right now, after one year, and again, I'm going to emphasize this. I just went over exams. Everybody made the same mistakes. I asked for cost of goods sold to give me ending inventory. I asked for the gross profit rate to give me the rate of cost of goods sold or something like that. So if you're asked for the carrying value of the bond after one year, it's after two interest periods if the bonds are semi-annual. Okay, just, you know, to repeat, to be sure. So the bonds are semi-annual so that at the end of the first year, the bonds will be carried at 103,280. They'll be carried at 103,280. Okay. All right, so the bonds, again, could sell for par, premium, and discount. S two things to remember. Cash interest does not change. Effective interest is always market. So I'm going to repeat that again. It doesn't matter what the bonds will sell for, whether they sell at par, premium, or discount. The cash interest does not change. That is on the face amount of the bond times the face rate. So the face amount of the bond times the face rate. The cash interest does not change. The effective interest is always equal to the market rate of interest. All right. Now, let's take some questions. Do you have any questions on bonds issued at par, premiums, or discounts? Yes. Yeah, if the bond, right. So if the bonds are issued at par, premium, or discount, the cash interest is always the same. The cash interest is the interest on the face amount of the bond times the face rate. But the effective interest is always equal to the market rate. Okay. All right. All right, so these first two, uh, I'm not going to worry about these. These are definitional. I want to go through some computations with you. Uh, this one is true, of course. The face value of the bond minus the current balance of the discount or plus the balance of the premium is, by definition, the carrying value. So that is the carrying value that's true. Discount is considered to be additional expense, and that's also true, right? So the discount on the bonds is additional expense. All right, so now, so take a look at this one. All right, I've got a company that on June 1st, 2015, issued 36,000, that's the par value, 8% bonds, maturing in five years, and they sell them for 4,500. And the bonds pay interest semi-annually. So what I need to know is the total amount of interest that is going to be paid 
to the bondholders on December 31st. December 31st. Uh, make sure you got the date straight. Last one. That's the issue price. 4500 is the issue price. I'll give, you, I'll give you a couple extra seconds there. I just added some time. I want to make, see, see what you can do. Before we, give, before we give you the answer, let's look at a picture. And these bonds were June, okay. June 1st. Okay. Actually, um, let's see, did you get that right? Uh, hold on a second. June 1st, it's uh, seven months. Hold on a second, I'll be sure. Hold on one second. Give me one second here. Hold on one second. Give me one second. I think it's supposed to be. Yeah. Okay. All right. So based on the now, I just want to look at the, the problem again. All right. There we go. All right. So, if the bonds are paying interest, if the bonds are paying interest every June 30th and December 31st, the best answer here would be what? A full year's interest would be next year. This is 2015. That's 2016. So 2880 would be for the full year. So. The way this problem is written, it would have to be for a half year, and that means that it should be half of that. Should be half of that. So it should be should be fourteen forty. Right. Okay. So. It's got to be 1440. Okay. Uh, let's try another one. All right, by the way, on this one, um, let me go back to this one. On this one, was there a discount or a premium? Let me go back for a second. Is there a discount or a premium? Discount or a premium? Okay, bonds were sold for 45. The par value is 36, so there's a premium, right? So the issue, the, the par value is 36, right?
right? I just want to be sure because I think that's maybe where you got some, I think. The par value, it said, they issued 36,000 bonds that mature in five years for 45. 45 is the issue price, so that's the amount they sold them for. There's a $9,000 premium on these bonds, right? I think, right? How did you read it? Did you read it that, that's one of the things we were talking about in the office about some of the multiple choice questions. Uh, these bonds, they issue 36,000. That is the par value. When they say four, that's the issue price. Okay, so that's the issue price. So those bonds sold for print. That, that obviously would have affected your answer if you used the 45,000 as the par value. The par value is 36 on this one. Okay. All right. Okay. All right, this one is just a uh, combo of this one. Let's do the next one. And um, says that on January 2nd of 2014, they issued 10,000 in bonds for 10.9. So I just want to be sure. Now, what is the par value of the bonds before we start? 10,000, right. So the par value is 10,000. The issue price is 10.9. Those bonds are sold for a premium. Five-year bonds with a stated rate of 4% and they pay interest semi-annually. They use the straight line method to amortize the bond premium and they want or at least we want to know the journal entry for the first interest payment. So was that true? Do you debit interest expense for 290, credit the premium and credit cash? So let's just see if that's true or false. So again, remember they're a premium. Alright, let's see. All right, that is, um, it's correct, it is, it is false. Okay, that is not the correct entry. So I'll let you see what it would be all about. First of all, what's the journal entry? Let me just show you what we're, um, uh, what's the journal entry to issue the bonds? What would be the journal entry when those bonds were issued? How much cash did you get? Bonds sold for premium, so you got 10,900, right, okay. 10.9, then you have bonds payable, and that's always at its par value, that's at 10, and then we've got the premium. The premium is at 900. Okay. Now, the premium is going to be amortized on a straight line basis. We also have to worry about the cash interest. So there's, a, there's the component of the cash interest Cash interest is paid on what amount? So I want to be sure. I'm asking questions. If you know this, it may sound easy, but I just want to be sure. Where do I pay? What's the basis for the cash interest? What amount? 10 or 10.9? 10. It's on the par value. The interest rate is 4%. Let me move this a little bit out further so you can see it. Interest rate is 4%, and that's semi-annual. Okay? So the interest is going to be 200 per period, 200 per period. The premium is going to be amortized. Okay. So the premium is going to be amortized, and that's going to be for 90. The effective interest expense is how much? 
does the premium increase or reduce interest? Reduces interest. So for those of you that debited interest expense for 290, it's wrong. If it was a discount, it's a different story, but here the premium reduces the interest expense, so the interest expense is 110. So the correct entry, the correct entry would be interest expense. Interest expense is always reflecting the market rate of 110. The premium gets reduced by 90, and the cash interest is always the same no matter how the bonds are or what, what price the bond is issued. So this is a good example, and the reason why I wanted to go through this problem, I want to go back over the material this way. So again, make sure you understand a premium will reduce interest expense, and in a lot of cases, Again, they went through about maybe six or eight exams today. And in every case, I know you may be running out of time, but it's just a matter of doing a very simple logic check. If you understand a premium and you added those numbers, you didn't do a logic check. The premium's got to reduce the interest expense. So just take a look at the calculation. Make sure you, you get a good feel for the direction in which the numbers should be going. Okay, so again, that one would be false. That is the correct journal entry. That is the correct journal entry. Okay. All right. Now, let's try one more, unless you have questions on that one. Okay, we're going to try one more. Same company. This time, same company. This time, the bonds are issued at 9,400. Same company, bonds are issued at 9,400. Okay. And we want to know if that is the correct journal entry for the first interest payment, not the first year. So is the entry of debit to interest expense for 260, credit to discount, and credit cash? Yes. Oh, I'm sorry. This question? Yes. Oh, I can't see. Okay. Oh, I'll put it up. Yep. All right, let's use this. Well, let's start that again. Hold on for a second. I'll start it again. All right. see. I'll, I'll, I'll raise that to 60 again, so let me move that up. Uh, can you see that now, I think? Okay. All right. Best we can do. All right, I'll start it again for 60 seconds. Good. All right, so the bonds, I'll, I'll keep you posted. So the bonds... The bonds sell for 94. Stated rate is the same. Everything's the same as the other company. The journal entry for the first interest payment. Yep. Times one half. Right. Times one half. It's semi annual. This is semi annual again. All right. You got about 30 seconds. always on the face value, not on the issue price. The question is, does the interest go on the face value or the issue price? It's on the face value or the par value. Okay. All right, five seconds. All right, true is correct. So let me go back to... All right, this is true. All right, this is correct. All right, so that's your answer. Okay. That is correct. All right. So again, let me make that smaller. Okay. All right. So that's the correct answer. The interest, the cash interest, stays the same at 200. 
The discount amortized is 600 divided by 10 periods. How do you get the discount of 600? Issue price of 9,004 minus the par value of 10,000. Okay, any other questions now on bonds issued for a premium or a discount? Any other questions? All right, let's go to the last, or one of the last learning objectives we have here. The title of this, or the learning objective here, is retiring bonds, but actually what we're going to look at is the possibility of paying off bonds before maturity date or at the maturity date. Paying off bonds either before or at maturity. If you pay the bonds at maturity, you assume that the discount or premium is fully amortized. So if you go back and look at some of the questions we had, some of the material, if the bonds are at maturity, the discount should be zero, the premium should be zero, and what should its carrying value be? Face value. Right? So you should have the par value on the books. It's very simple. If they're going to pay back those bonds for 100000 at maturity, you debit bonds payable in credit cash as you would any other liability. So if you're asked a question regarding the payment of a bond at maturity, the discount and premium have to be zero. The discount or premium would have to be zero. Now, it gets a little bit more difficult if you retire bonds before maturity. Yeah, okay. If you retire bonds before maturity, it would leave a balance of the premium or the discount. So once again, look at the last exam. In exam two, you had questions where you had to sell an asset. You had to bring the depreciation up to the date of the sale. The same thing may happen here. You may have to bring the premium or the discount amortization up to the date of the purchase. Now, why would you buy your bonds before maturity? You would buy bonds back before maturity. You pay them off early for lots of reasons. I would imagine there's probably at least half the class here with someone that they know owned a home and refinanced their mortgage when interest rates went down, correct? So if someone in your family had a mortgage at 8%, interest rates dropped to like 3%, why would you want to pay 8%? You pay your mortgage off early for 8% and you borrow again at 3 Corporations do the same thing. Some bonds could be called. There's a call provision. So if you ever start investing in bonds or in your pension plan, the bond contract could say that beginning in 2013, we have the right to call the bonds in at any time we want, either at par value or maybe at a slight premium, but those bonds could be called early for the same reason. Now, why would you want to call the bonds in rather than buy them in the open market? Well, the bond price, actually, bond in this case, yeah. Right, so in this case, what may happen is that if you have two choices, I would rather call a bond because the call price is fixed. So everybody in this room gets par value. That's the way it would work. If everybody in this room held one of these smart touch bonds and one of my bonds, I would say, I'm calling them today. Give me the paper. Everyone here gets par value. But if I decided to go to the open market and start talking to you individually to buy back the bonds, what might happen? Somebody's going to figure out, hey, this guy wants to pay his bonds off. I'm holding, I'm going to hold back and wait and get a higher price. So what will happen is that the price will start to go up and it may cost more. So the call would probably be cheaper than an open market repurchase. So basically, whether you call it or whether you will go ahead and go through an open market repurchase, these are some of the reasons. You know, you want to take, you want to refinance just like an individual. You want to refinance, take advantage of lower interest rates. You may also have some excess cash, and therefore you may want to get out of debt. Um, you know, you might want to get rid of those interest charges, and that will happen if you want to pay the debt off early. And then, of course, you may want to improve your debt equity ratio, which is the last thing you'll see in this, uh, this chapter. And then finally, number four is important because in a lot of cases, and this is a management issue, 
when you borrow, you could be subject to certain restrictions. Individuals could be subject to certain restrictions as well. If you borrow money to buy a car, in certain auto loan agreements, it'll say you're not permitted to lease a car during the period of this loan. Why? Because leasing is almost like debt. You have to pay it off every month. So there could be some restrictions. So therefore, to maybe if you really want to lease and you don't want to hold the car, you, you, know, you want to take a second car, you want to expand your fleet if it's a uh, delivery service, you want to get rid of one of these vehicles, you may pay off the auto loan and then lease it. By paying off the auto loan, it gives you the freedom to lease the other car. So there could be some restrictive covenants. Now, when you buy back or pay the debt early, you have to remember that the bonds have to be removed completely. You have to remove the par value. You have to remove the premiums or discounts that remain. The cash paid generally, of course, will not equal the carrying value or face value. And this is a very, those last two line items here are very much common sense. If you could pay less to pay off your debt, if you owe me $1,000 and I say, give me $800, you are off the hook, it's a gain. Right? So if you pay less than the carrying value, it's a gain. If you pay more to retire them, it's going to be a loss. Now, why would you pay more to retire them? Well, just take a look at the refinancing issue. Anyone in your family who recently refinanced their loans or their mortgages had to pay a lawyer, had to pay closing fees. They, there's other uh, expenses that get. So there's obviously a cost in some cases to refinance. It may be worth it to save the interest over the term of the mortgage. So let's take an example. Smart Touch would like to retire its bonds. They pay $95,000. Uh, after two interest payments. And the discount on the balance sheet is 3081 So they give you, we may not give this to you, we may ask you to calculate the discount after two periods to get the carrying value. Uh, and of course the face value is 100000 So in this case, the bonds would have a carrying value of 96919 That is the par minus the discount on the bonds. So if you had to look at this from the standpoint of a of the T accounts, put this up on the screen again. Sorry about that. Oops. Okay, so on the T accounts, bonds payable have a credit balance of a hundred, the discount we tell you it has a debit balance. Make that smaller. Sorry about that. There we go. Has a, a debit balance of 3081. And the carrying value is 96919. You could also get that off of an amortization table as well. Now, again, from the standpoint of exams and quizzes and homework, you may not have this number up to date. You may have to amortize it up to the date of the transaction. But given that number, that is your carrying value. Now, in this case, Smart Touch pays 9,500 to retire those bonds. So technically, they owe somebody 96,919 at this point, this moment in time. They are able to pay that off at a price of $95,000, that means there's a gain on retirement. There's a gain on early retirement. So going back to the slide, you'll see that the gain is $1,919. So the gain is $1,919. That gain goes into the income statement. That is other revenue and expenses. It's not part of normal operations, but it is part of other revenues and expenses. Now, when you look at the journal entry, make sure that you realize that you have to remove the par value of the bond is made zero by a debit. You will make the discount zero by crediting that account. You credit cash for the amount you pay. And of course, the gain goes into the gain account, and that goes on the income statement. So bonds are retired before maturity. Yes, question? That's a gain to the buyer, right? 
It's a gain to the corporation, the issuing corporation, who's buying back, yes, who's buying back the bonds. Right. So that is a gain to the person buying the bonds back before maturity. Now, in this case, if, you know, holding everything else constant, if the bonds, in this case, if you're paying them back and there's a gain, does anyone know what's happening to market interest rates? Why are you paying less for these bonds in the open market? Going up. Interest rates are going up, making your bonds less valuable. So in the marketplace right now, if you're able to get these bonds like really cheap, it means that your bonds might be paying 6%, market rates are going higher, nobody really wants your bonds at par value, so they're discounted and you can get them at a gain. Now, of course, if you wanted to refinance at this point, that could be a problem. But if you just want to pay off your debt, it's a good time to do that. All right. Yeah, there's one last thing in this chapter. We're not going to do any questions here because they're pretty much uh, definitional. Um, just want to let you know this is what the bonds would look like on the balance sheet. Okay, so if you look at the bonds in the balance sheet, that's what they would look like. That's 84. And then just one last thing I wanted to show you before. I'm going to say something about 13, a couple of minutes. Um, you are going to be responsible for this debt equity ratio. And the debt equity ratio is basically going to measure. Yeah, by the way, yeah, let's, um, you know, only because I noticed that if you look at the quiz, it's sort of like this garbage time, which is like from 210 to 220, usually on a Friday afternoon. If I cover something, those are the questions that people are getting like really wrong a lot, like consistently. So let's make sure we pay attention to this. This is definitely on today's quiz. Um, at 4 o'clock, it'll be posted. All right, now, you got this debt equity ratio. The debt equity ratio measures the proportion of debt in a company's capital structure. You should be familiar with the term financial leverage, simply meaning that you will earn more on your borrowed funds than the cost of borrowing. Now, you might see people that use debt incorrectly. A lot of individuals use debt incorrectly. They will borrow money on the credit card, for example, or some people get home equity lines of credit. If you're borrowing money on a home equity line of credit and you're paying like 5 or 6%, you better be using that money to invest in your house or something else that will give you more than 5%. And I know a lot of people that were using home equity lines to pay utility bills, to pay grocery bills, to buy gas for their car. That is not financial leverage. Financial leverage means that you are able to use the borrowed funds for a higher rate of return than your cost of borrowing. Now, the debt equity ratio will tell you, not necessarily about their leverage, but it will tell you whether or not the company is financing more with debt than equity. It is simply a measure of or measured of financial risk. It is the measure of total liabilities divided by total stockholders equity. It's a very simple ratio. And they give you examples. They tend to use this Green Mountain coffee a lot in the book. So in this case, if you wanted to calculate the ratio of debt to equity for this company, for 2011, it would simply be the ratio of liabilities to total equity. And in this case, the debt to equity ratio was 0.67. Now, whether or not the ratio is a good result or a poor result depends on a couple of things. It depends on the company's industry, and it also depends on the company's history. Are they trying to reduce debt? Is there any reason why the debt equity ratio is, is less than one? So again, the debt equity ratio is something that you definitely would need to know for this next round of quizzes and of course for the final. Now, what we're going to do is we're going to spend just a couple of minutes looking at this stockholder's equity. Uh, okay. Oops, sorry about that. Okay. Just want to introduce this. And I don't have, actually don't have much to say on the first part of this because the very first um, few slides here will talk about the characteristics of, sorry. Yeah, 
Uh, I mentioned this earlier. I think I sent out a, uh, a Blackboard notice. We're not going to cover appendices 12A and 12B. That's the time value of money. We're not going to cover that. You pick that up in another course. Okay. So in chapter 13, and just by way of introduction, we're not, in this case, when you look at the characteristics, this is something we covered way back at the beginning of the semester. So I'm going to ask you to review a lot of this on your own. You should know, and this is something you would have studied for the final anyway, um, you know, the definition of a corporation, we talked about private and publicly held companies. We also talked about advantages and disadvantages, so we're not going to do anything on that. What I want to do is go right to the objectives. So if you go to slide 12, and again, I'm not skipping the rest of that, that is just something we already did. When we look at the stockholders' equity section, we have to understand that the primary objective of accounting for stockholders' equity is to disclose the sources of equity. Where did the equity come from? Where is it going? And the reason for that is unlike a sole proprietorship. So for example, if you had your own business, you would know exactly your investments and you would know exactly the withdrawals you have from the business. You would know exactly how that, in, that cash flow was used. If you were a partnership, you would know exactly where the cash came from where are the sources of equity? The problems with corporations, when you have a widespread ownership, hundreds of thousands of people own the shares, there is a separation of management and the ownership of the company, and therefore there is a certain amount of accountability that is known as stewardship, that the disclosures must clearly indicate the sources of equity and how that equity is being used. You also need to disclose where or where there are any restrictions, and what are the rights of each class of stock. So if you wanted to buy common stock, preferred stock, what type of class of stock did you want to invest in, they have different rights and priorities. One of the key disclosures you're going to see on the balance sheet is going to be parenthetically on the balance sheet, you're going to find the number of shares that are authorized by the state, the number of shares that are issued, and the number of shares that are outstanding. Issued shares are the maximum amount that the company can issue. It is registered with the state. So if I, and anyone can incorporate themselves, so if I decide to incorporate myself, I probably would not go, you know, too large, but I would go to an, a lawyer, and we'd go to the state of New York or New Jersey, and I would register 100 shares for my company. Then I would issue shares to myself, and I would issue maybe one share, and I'd be the sole owner. I'd own all of the stock that has been issued. The key is, again, authorize is what I can sell. Issue is what has been distributed. Outstanding shares are the shares that are still in the hands of the stockholder. Outstanding shares, by definition, are issued minus treasury. What are treasury shares? Treasury shares are shares that the company buys back. Why does a company buy back its own stock? Treasury shares are companies, sh Apple buys back their own stock. Why? Yeah, increases the stock price. So in other words, if I had 233 shares, you all own one share of stock, I buy back half the class, the stock price doubles, right? Because I now take shares out of the market. The total value of the company doesn't change. So the total value of Apple doesn't change, but it's now divided by fewer shares. I also buy back those shares, perhaps for stock options or stock purchase plans. If you work for Apple, I'm sure you're getting stock options. Stock options means I don't pay you in cash all the time. I pay you in shares of stock. Where do I get those shares of stock from? I get them from the treasury. So treasury shares are shares that the company buys back. They are not issued. I mean, they're still issued, but no longer outstanding. And there's your diagram for, for that. 